we're really calling it a non-emergency uh, surgery, or you could call it an elective procedure or a non-essential procedure, but it's basically a surgical procedure that is not urgently required in order to maintain the health of the patient. Most bays and neuters, even pre-adoption surgeries, are non-emergency procedures. So it means it doesn't have to happen right now. My approach to spay-neuter surgery at this time during this global crisis is to focus on essential health care that is life-saving. In the case of spay-neuter, the only procedures that I can foresee as truly being immediately and urgently life-saving would be pyometra surgery and dystocia surgery. Any other spay-neuter surgery, including of pregnant animals at this time, cannot be considered to be life-saving. It does mean that we will need to be able to build out capacity to handle more animals in foster that are having litters and, and to support those new foster homes that are taking home pregnant animals and having litters that they need to care for over the next few weeks. It really help us understand the big picture of why this needs to happen. I think what's really important to think about is that it's not just conservation of PPE that we're talking about. There's a lot of other reasons for deferring these non-emergency surgeries. And I think the biggest, most important one is protecting humans and protecting human life. Um, we read everywhere we turn right now that what we all really need to do is stop everything that we don't need to be doing. Um, and so by continuing to ask veterinarians and technicians to do surgery, we're continuing to have people coming into the shelter to work. We're continuing to have people even just maintaining social distancing during surgical procedures would be difficult to do. Um, it's not even just the people who are coming in to do those surgeries. It's the people that they may interact with later. We know that this, this virus has what we call an r naught or the infectious potential to, for each person to infect about three other people. And so when we start to pass that down the line, each activity that we do that isn't necessary, I mean, even each activity that we do do presents risk to the whole community. We have to rethink everything about the way we've lived our daily lives and the things that are important to us. It doesn't mean they aren't still important to us, but we may have to set some of those things aside for right now. Um, so, you know, we know also that as staff are coming in to take care of the animals, what we want to try to do is limit the amount of work they have to do so that we can limit the amount of staff that's in the shelter. Also, even shelters that are talking to us and saying, well, we have enough supplies. Um, you may right now, but if you may use supplies now doing spay neuter surgery that you will need later for doing an emergency surgery on an animal that comes in who needs care, or you may use supplies now that the hospital is actually going to ask you for later because of the scarcity of supplies. So there's the supplies, there's, there's this human issue of, of really trying to keep everybody safe. They're very important issues. Thank you. Kim, you talk to a lot of shelters almost on a daily basis. And, you know, you and I have been sharing some stories of, about different organizations or groups who are really struggling with this. And so we know that there are some groups out there that are hesitant to adopt out intact animals. And Kim, has that been your experience in your calls around the country? I think it's, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, and I, and I think that the animal advocates are really putting a lot of pressure on some of the shelters that might want to shut down their programs. And so they're questioning whether or not 
that they should do that. And I think that, you know, we just have to approach this compassionately because we've told these people for years and years and years that they need to spay neuter, right? So animal advocates, I mean, that's their messaging. Um, and so I think that we need to just give them the facts on this and give them a little bit, give them some time to digest it. And I've had some of those conversations today and I think it's gone really well. I do see the rescue groups more than the shelters actually being reluctant to send out an unaltered pet. So Dr. Lovey, what kind of advice would you be giving to rescue groups right now who are struggling with this? I completely understand and I share the concern that everybody in the TNR community cat world and rescue world is feeling right now. I built my own program that I invested two decades in that I'm very passionate about TNR. And, but I'm also been in it long enough that I remember, you know, just a little over two decades ago that neuter before adoption and TNR was not the standard of care. And we, we can recover, we can pause on our current standard of care. It will be a setback this kitten season. There is no doubt we are gonna have to have catch up that is very creative when this, this is over hopefully in a few months. It, it will be a few months before we get back to normal. Uh, hopefully it will not be a few weeks. We are in a long game and we have to preserve our resiliency to recover for this. If we allow shelter staff and clinic staff to get sick and be taken out of the game now because we're not willing to cut back and shelter in place like we need to right now, we are going to be in much worse off shape in the future. I do want to share, you know, some of the concerns that I'm hearing are, are very legitimate logistical concerns about how we can recover on the other side. One is how we can possibly track hundreds if not thousands of animals that have been sent to foster homes and sent to uh, adopters that are not neutered. And the software companies are really stepping up for us and developing these mass tools to track these animals and then when we're ready to get them back in to automate all of that follow-up. Another like really encouraging sign too that I heard today was an example after Hurricane Harvey in Houston which devastated that community and the rescuing of, anim of thousands of animals and immediately putting them into foster homes or sending them um, out of state even with very minimal communication and contacts when they followed up after the disaster, 80% of those people had gone ahead and had their pets spayed and neutered on their own without intervening and reminding from the shelters. So we know that the system is not going to be perfect to have these adoption contracts and voucher systems, but we know it's a lot better than it probably used to be in the past. And then we'll be able to do better follow up with the new software tools that we have to get them in. But there's no doubt this, this is hard times, but this is also an international pandemic and the threat of not locking down and staying home for all of us is very, very real against people and the animals we're trying to help. Thank you. Is there anything else that is top of mind for the two of you right now? Is there anything you wanna share about um, sheltering, what some of the challenges are? I think the thing that I would love to say is just how incredibly encouraging it's been to me in the last couple of weeks working with everybody on the national level, local level, individual or animal shelters. What an incredible group of people are working with and for shelters and how much I hope you will all take care of yourselves and take care of each other and, and get through this. And, and even though we're talking about spay neuter, I think really we are talking about that larger concept that we all need to recognize what a threat there is right now and do everything we can to keep everyone we can safe. Right now, it's been so encouraging to see the community step up in a way they never have before in the history of animal sheltering, to support their shelters, to empty the shelters so that the shelters will be there for essential services only, and to put an unprecedented number of animals in new homes and in foster homes. 
it's so encouraging. And on the other hand, we're really gonna have to build systems that support those new foster homes because a lot of them have never done it before. And when the shelters are locked down, it won't be so easy to provide care for neonatal kittens and animals that get sick and foster. So we have a lot of work to do still to figure out how we're gonna use telemedicine and other tools to support all these animals until things return to normal. All right, thank you. Kim, do you have any thoughts you wanna share as we come to a close? I don't, just that we're fortunate to have these shelter medicine programs and um, it's, just, it's, it's just so inspiring. Well, thank you both so much for joining Kim and I. We um, look to you for guidance and leadership and you continue to be uh, the voice of reason and expertise. And we are just so grateful for all the hard work that you and your teams are putting in to helping um, identify factual information and clarifying misconceptions. Uh, your voices are very powerful and we really just want you to know that we want you to take care of yourselves so that you can keep guiding and leading all of us. So thank you for your time. And we will, I'm sure, be talking with you again soon. So drink your water and stay home. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.